case over the last couple months that this 2,500-year-old book of Nehemiah is actually for the modern age. It's for the modern mind. It's really hard to see that through passages like this, that this timeless word of God is perfect for time-bound creatures like you and me. Um, that's why in this chapter it happens to be one of the most skipped chapters when people are traveling through the book of Nehemiah. And so I'm excited to go through it because I think it offers a radically refreshing question to you and me. And that is this, how does God see me when I sin again and again and again? How does God see me? You see, you and I, if you are in Christ, we're people that would say we believe in the gospel. But we also need help with our unbelief in the gospel at the same time. And you can always kind of determine what your gospel comprehension really is by how you interact with God when you feel most dirty. I mean, when you're stained by sin, it's easy to get this gospel amnesia. And when we do that, we kind of revert back to what we know to do in order to survive. And the number one thing we do is we avoid all eye contact with God, don't we? Whenever we sin, we try to swerve around him because that's how we handle each other. We want to just avoid him until we feel cleaner, until we have performed a little bit better. It's a shame-based way of living, but we'll do it in order to be liked again. So today's passage is going to be helpful for Christians who find themselves under discipline from the Lord. Okay, and I'm going to explain a little bit more what that word means, discipline. We'll unpack it a little bit, but how does God see you when you were under discipline. And just to recap it, maybe this is your first time here and you're unaware of how Nehemiah works. Um, well, again, we're about halfway through it, but what you've missed up to this point, if I could just say it very briefly, is the Lord moved on the heart of a cupbearer to the king. And so did something to ruin his heart, really, break his heart for a destroyed Jerusalem. So he is obedient. He petitions the king. I mean, this is a guy that had a great job. He petitioned the king, I would love to go and rebuild the walls of a kingdom that's already been conquered. And the king says yes. And he says, I'll bankroll it as well. So he goes. He finds enemies almost immediately. He finds greed inside his walls almost immediately. He finds problems. He finds an unwilling people. He finds all kinds of stuff, really. And 52 days later, we saw last week, the walls finally go up. Now the walls are up. But now what? It's almost like we're in the story where that proverbial dog who chases the car has finally caught the car and doesn't know what to do with it. We get to this point where we see the walls go up and we're kind of waiting for the rest of the story. And here's the answer. This was never really about the walls, the book of Nehemiah. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus being worshiped by a very distinct people. And I know when you hear that, you might think, Luke, you got your timeline mixed up. Jesus doesn't come for a few hundred more years. And you're right in that. He does not show up on the scene for a while. But they are waiting for him. You see, Israel anticipated a Messiah. They were waiting for a heroic Savior to come. The Jewish people actually expected that he would come from the bloodline of David, which is why you find those unique lineages in the beginning of Matthew and the beginning of Luke. Whether it's tracing the mother's side or the father's side, they land in that royal bloodline that belongs to David. The Messiah was understood to be the one who would free Israel so that they could properly worship God as a distinct people, to live in abundance, to live in justice. They're not rebuilding everything just so they could get the band back together. They're awaiting a Savior who will come and carry the torch. Sadly, many of them are still waiting, right? There are many that are still waiting. The Jesus that came and lived and died and lived again is not who they see is this Messiah. That's sad, really. This story... The story of Nehemiah is actually maybe a portrait of your whole Bible in some ways because it's about the restoration of a broken and needy people to do one thing, and that is worship Jesus with their lives. That's really what the book of Nehemiah is about, but that's also what your Bible is about. That's what the story of the gospel is about. So step one was build walls. Now they've got to fill it up. They have to build the city that's inside of it. I want you to remember that this city had been blasted by Babylon. It's nothing but ruins, right? It looked like rubble. And it was an indefensible slum, I guess you could say, in some ways. And so Nehemiah had a lot of work to do, which is why he lingers there for 12 more years. 
You see, Nehemiah spends 12 years, but it's, it didn't even take him six months to fix the wall. So what does he do for the next 11 and a half years? Well, he builds a people. That's why there's more chapters to this book. And I would even make the case that the work is going to get harder for him. Right? You see, working with things is hard. Stones, mortar, gates, tools. I think working with things is really hard. Some of you, you love it. You have workshops, you're carpenters, you have pegboards that are full of tools and waiting for new tools. It's just secret happy place for you. But even if that's you, even if that is you, you have to admit that there's still difficulty waiting for you whenever you enter that shop. Drill bits break, you get splinters. Listen, I was working on something yesterday I, my wife told me it would take one hour. This will take one hour. And I didn't even falter for it. I never once said, hey, you said this was going to take one hour because I'm, I've been married for 25 years and I know how to do that math. She says one hour. I say three in my head. And I just block out three hours. That way I might be happy by the end of it. But I know it's not going to be one hour. And sure enough, two hours in, not her fault, but two hours in, I gick my finger and it bleeds. And then I'm like, you know what? Pass me a flamethrower. I, I knew I should have bought a flamethrower when Elon was selling those things because that would have changed my whole Saturday. It would have been a fun Saturday from that time over because I would have melted that whole thing. Working with things is hard. I'm just going to say working with people is harder. It is much, much harder, especially when it comes to reorienting their posture to do something that they don't want to do. There's a famous quote from Rosalind Carter. A leader takes people where they want to go a great leader takes people where they don't necessarily want to go but ought to be. I find that to be true. Leading people who did not ask to be led, leading people who did not want to be led, that's worse than splinters. It's worse than splinters. So I'm going to look at this passage because it's going to answer this ultimate question on how does God see us whenever we are under discipline. Chapter 7, verses 1 through Four, we're going to read this. This is the word of the Lord for us. Now, when the wall had been built, and I set up the doors and the gatekeepers, the singers and the Levites had been appointed. I gave my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the governor of the castle, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a more faithful and God-fearing man than many. And I said to them, let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they are still standing guard, let them shut and bar the doors. Appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, some at their guard posts and some in front of their own homes. The city was wide and large, but the people within it were few and no houses had been rebuilt. Okay, so he's appointed some key positions and some key people. Gatekeepers, singers, and Levites were appointed first. Maybe it's just me. Maybe you wondered the same thing. If I was building a city, I don't know if I would start with pastors and worship leaders, right? I think I ought to be thinking more along the lines of infrastructure. We need KUB here. We need, some, we need waste management. We need someone to build roads. Probably good to have some judges. That's what we need. But that's not what they did. Gatekeepers were even set in. Gatekeepers, by the way, were traditionally keeping the gate over the temple, not the city. He relocated them from the temple to the city. I don't know what special skill set you need to be a gatekeeper. I don't know if they knew karate or had eyesight and they can kind of see where trouble was brewing better than all the rest of everyone else. But anyway, they were good at it. And he said, we're going to move you guys over to the gate. So what you effectively have is church bouncers. You have worship leaders and you have pastors set in. Why? Why? Why start there? Here's the reason. God's people exist to worship God. That's it. That's why we exist. That's why they existed, to worship God. In fact, they stood out in this way. They're, d they're d different from all the other nations around them. And there were a lot of nations around them. But they celebrate this thing called the Sabbath. So while they're resting, other nations are producing 15% more in that week because they're not giving up that time. They have a different idea of justice than all the nations around them. A few weeks ago, we talked about slavery, debt slavery, and how their view on how to handle other humans that were in heavy debt differed from all the other nations. They handled money differently than other nations, food differently than other nations. Everything was handled totally different. They existed as a distinct people to worship God. 
So, of course, you're going to begin building the city with this in mind. And then he said in these two key men, Hanani, who was in chapter 1, he's the guy that brought Nehemiah the bad news to begin with. So he's always kind of been in the mixture. He's always been in the mix here. Him and this other guy, Hananiah, they're basically border patrol agents over this city, focused on the entry points, and there were a few entry points to this city. All right. Hey, is it okay if I say border patrol and no one get bent in the room? I mean, I just want to remind you of something that we said way back in week one, whenever we were just cutting into the book of Nehemiah. We have to be careful of importing today's blah, blah, blah into a 2,500-year-old text that is ultimately about Jesus. We've got to be careful with that. Nehemiah is not a book about the best domestic American policy. We are not meant to draw a straight line from what we see there all the way to what we have today in 2024 when it comes to the politics of it all. Listen, you can have whatever thought you want and vote whatever direction you want to do. I'm I'm going to, but be careful. I have to be careful. You have to be careful of baptizing our political views with passages like this. It's getting boring, and I'm seeing it everywhere. It doesn't even make any sense. What he is doing is reorienting Israel to be distinct as God's own people for the point of worship. It's not what we're dealing with today. You see, when you read old passages like this as an expositor or as one who exegetes, and all that means is that we draw it out, we, we pull the passage out and examine it under, under a microscope, we're looking for some key things. What did it mean for them? What did it mean for them? That's the main idea. What is the main idea for them, the original audience Another question you have to ask, how does it reflect or gather the light from the gospel, catch the light of the gospel? What I mean is, is when you look at the overarching story of what God has done for mankind through the person of Jesus, how does that interact with this passage, instruct, drive, color this passage? Another question is, how does it address the brokenness of your heart? How does it touch how you feel. Does it reflect how you feel? Is it contrasting how you feel? Another one is, how do we walk now in light of this? That's how you read passages that are old. You just don't draw straight lines carelessly. Nehemiah is instituting a strict border policy. Fences have a purpose, right? Walls have a purpose. Not everyone can come in. That's what a wall means. Maybe you live in a home that has a fence. I'm living in my first home to never have a fence. I live in a a condo in a community and everyone's just kind of walking around and I'll be plinking on my computer and some guy's walking right by my window, some worker that's working on the community right there. And I'm like, man, that's kind of crazy. People could just walk around. But if you have a fence, what does that say? You can't come over here unless your last name is the same as mine, right? You're over there doing your thing. We're over here doing our thing. You let your dog pee and poop all over the yard, which is why it looks like it does. Your flowers never look good. I've got nice mulch over here and a fire ring. We have our stuff. You have your stuff. We grill out. You don't. That's just the way it is, right? Walls. Separation is the key thing. They did not spend 52 days building these walls for sentimentality. That's not why. It was to keep people out. And it was to keep people in so that they could reconstitute a nation that had been dissolving over the last 70 years. 70 years, it was looking less and less and less and less like God's people. And it's interesting because in verse 4 it says that the city was wide and the city was large, except, except for it really wasn't. I mean, between you and me, we wouldn't think of this place as big at all. Scholars disagree on how big it is. Some say it was around 90 to 100 acres, <laughs> Some say it was around 200 to 220 acres. So it was between the size of our downtown or the fort, if you were to just draw it out. I took the time to just kind of lay it over our city, and that's about how big it is. But they figured out a way to get about 50,000 people in there too. So it is fairly dense when you think about it that way. But which 50,000? How did they do that? How did they decide who was going to live in this city and who was not? And this is where it's brilliant. This is where he does something really brilliant and key. Let's look at verse 5. Then my God put it into my heart. It's the second time he says that in the whole book. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. And I found the book of the genealogy of those who came up at the first. And I found written in it. These were the people of the province 
who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his town. This is what he's doing. Let's pause there. He reached back into the records, and he pulled out that source list of those who originally came over. Not with him, but with those journeys before him, even. In fact, you're going to find almost, almost an exact copy of this list in Ezra 2. Ezra 2 is almost identical to what we're reading now. It was the most accurate record of who was a true Jew. Right? Now, here's the thing. We're not going to read all those names and numbers. Maggie, would you splash them up there? I just want you to take a good look. All right. About 60 verses of that. We're not going to read them all. I did this a few chapters ago, so you weren't sure, were you? You thought, as you're looking at your Bible, he's going to do it. He's going to read every single one just to prove a point. (laughs) And I did do that to prove a point, right? I was proving a point, if you remember, that it took several different kinds of people that did several different things for a living in several different parts of the city from several different towns to all come together and work on one big project, right? So we felt the need, or I did, to lead you through every painful name that you have already forgotten, right? But this is going to be a little bit different because we're going to preach that passage by looking at it. We're going to stand back and look at the whole thing and prove a different point. I mean, I see these 60 verses that she was splashing through, and they all look pretty much like that. And this is what I think. This could have been way shorter. Could have been way shorter. Just give us the sum total. Nehemiah, I don't need you to show your math, right? I just want to know how many people moved in. I'm sure you need it, but... Why do we need to see it? Why do you need to see all of those names and all of those numbers? Why is it important for you today in June of 2024? Here's why it is. You were meant to see that all these people mattered and all these people counted. All of them would be needed. All of them are part of something much bigger. And you also see that God is constantly filling what God builds. This is a key theme for God. Right? He's always building something, and then he's always filling it. I want you to consider, just for a split second, we're going to look at the very end of time, another kingdom that God is building that he has gates and a roster of who can enter. It's not Jerusalem. It's a new Jerusalem. Revelation 21, 27, it says this, Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Recorded citizens inside of a built space are part of a larger scope of God's story. This is a beautiful way of seeing the Bible. If you stand back and look at the whole story, the whole arc of it, God builds the world, and then what does he do? He fills it, right? God builds the ark through Noah, and then what does he do? He fills it. God builds his family through Abraham, and then what does he do? He, he fills it. He builds Jerusalem through Nehemiah, and then he fills it. He builds the church through Jesus, and then he fills it. God builds heaven, and then he fills it. What does this show you and me? It shows us that there are no anonymous, empty suits. Everyone matters. Everyone matters. You are not a placeholder. There's no version of you that is barely known, partially loved, barely considered, because of your lack of performance. It's an important point to constantly revisit because again, we get an amnesia. This is a small room. We walk into rooms like this and if your mind is a normal mind, it would be easy and normal for you to look across and say, there's a couple that I bet they didn't fight on the way up here. Because they just look like the kind of couple that would not fight on the way to church. And look at how she handles her kids. It's so beautiful. Look at how that guy leads. He's just so much more advanced. I mean, we judge other people when we look at them, and what do we feel like on the list, some pecking order that we've created in our mind? We're somewhere in the mid all the way to the bottom, aren't we? That's how we appraise a room. That's what we do when we walk in and we look at a room. We immediately place ourselves in that room. We do it subconsciously even. It's amnesia. We say to ourselves, surely they are loved and considered by God far more than I am because I have stains. I've got a past. I don't fit in. You almost feel exiled, right? Here's the thing. Can we consider for a moment, why was there an exile to begin with? I mean, we're talking about these walls going up and filling it with people 
off a rock. But, but why, were they, why were they exiled to begin with? What, what started all of this? This is what it says in Jeremiah 25. Stay where you're at in Nehemiah. I'm just going to read this to you. Jeremiah 25, 4. And though the Lord had sent all his servants, the prophets, to you again and again, you have not listened or paid attention. Therefore, the Lord Almighty says this, because you have not listened to my words, I will summon all the peoples of the north and my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, declares the Lord. And I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. I will banish from the sounds of joy and gladness the voice of the bride and the bridegroom, the sound of millstones and the light of the lamp. The whole country will become a desolate wasteland, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon. How many years? Seventy years. This is 70 years earlier, right? How do you think it felt those 70 years when they were in exile under discipline? How do you think they, do you think they felt like they mattered? Probably not. They probably felt like they were forgotten, abandoned, rightfully so. They've been warned and warned and warned. It's really not that hard to imagine. Because when you fail and you find yourself under discipline, do you feel like you matter anymore? Or do you feel like God is so disgusted that he just leaves the room or he exiles you out of the room until what? Until you perform better. You just behave better. And not just immediately. You have to show that you really mean it, right? So you have to grovel a little bit. You have to triple down on everything. You have to put weeks of this together just to get God to look at you and smile again. This is a gospel misfire. The gospel is that God is faithful to failures. He's faithful to repeat offenders. If that's not true, then the gospel is not good news anymore. It's far from it. After 70 years of discipline, what do we see? God brings his people back. Discipline has a time limit. It's not permanent. It's not permanent. Jeremiah 29, four chapters later, it says this. Jeremiah says this. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, the Lord says, and I will fulfill to you my promises and bring you back to this place, which is what's happening right now. This is fulfilling prophecy. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Man, we have used that passage so many times. The last part, that's speaking to a people <laughs> that are under discipline. The people that are getting spanked. That's where these words are being cast in the direction of those who are wondering if they've even mattered anymore in the eyes of God. Quick question, are you being discipled right now? Are you being discipled in the fact that you're growing to see Jesus more clearly, to understand the gospel more clearly? But here's a bigger question for today. Do you feel like you're being disciplined now? Disciplined. If you are, and you feel like you've been exiled, you're in that 70-year period, God looks at you through some kind eyes, affirming eyes. He considers you deeply. He wants for you a hope and a future. And I don't think we could bring ourselves to believe this very well when we're all being disciplined, can we? It's just too hard to get our arms around, that he would want anything to do with us. I think it's how we handle each other. Maybe it's how we were handled by our parents. But it's hard for us to see this. This is what it says in Hebrews 12, though. Stay again where you're at. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. For God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Here's the thing. A larger discussion could be had today on whether your discipline is because you've sinned. It might not be. Let me complicate this a little bit. Sometimes, friend, you are being uncomfortably shaped by the Lord, and it's not because you've sinned. It's not because you're living in some pervasive rebellion. Hebrews 5 says something real curious. It says that Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. 
if he learned obedience, does that mean he came from a place of disobedience? Because that's what we think, right? If I learn obedience, that meant at one time I was disobedient. Is that what it's saying about Jesus? No, it's not. He, he learned obedience because he was not disobedient, but he was encountering increasing difficulties as he grew. And then the outcome, every time he bumped into a difficulty, was a, a more excellent obedience, a more refreshing and brilliant obedience. Obedience. Jesus would grow in stages, just like you would imagine he would. And he would express this impressive obedience as he encountered a broken world. Every opportunity he found would result in a more a larger and a more beautiful obedience. Sometimes you feel difficulty in your life, and it's got nothing to do with rebellion in your life. He's simply shaping you. He's simply molding you. He's growing you. It's a kindness. He loves you. But let me complicate it a little bit more. Sometimes you've sinned and you don't receive what feels like a spanking. You know what I'm saying? Romans 2, the kindness of God is meant to lead you to repentance. Hey, listen, have you ever done something wrong and you did not feel the boot drop in your life? First of all, it is a kindness of God to discipline you. So it's not to say that God is not kind whenever you feel the discipline and he is very kind when you don't feel the discipline. Both of it is a kindness from the Lord. But have you ever done something that was just atrocious or broken, some sort of a sin, and yet God shows you how kind he is, how beautiful he is, how unrelenting he is in his pursuit of you, and it just melts you. You just melt, and you think, man, Lord, you are so kind. And it draws you into repentance. It pulls you straight into repentance. Man, sometimes I get handled far better than I deserve, and sometimes I feel the pain, and it has nothing to do with sin on my part. I'm simply being shaped for deeper obedience. Let me uncomplicate it for you. You can know whether your felt discipline is from sin or not by one way, reading the Bible. Read the Bible, because if you try to calculate your pain through how you feel, you're just going to get mixed up. It always sounds like this. It always sounds like, man, am I, is God mad at me? Is he punishing me? These are the words we use. Is he disciplining me? How do I know? Because my transmission light came on. My boss is being a donkey. My ulcers are back. I can't sleep. My wife's being rude to me. I don't know what to, I mean, gosh, God, I've done everything. This is, this is what we sound like. I've done everything. I've even read the Bible every day. I'm not missing church. I'm doing everything. I thought I was going to get blessed in this. Friend, that's just, that's karma. That's not Christianity at all. Christianity is God has behaved for us in the person of Christ to bring all of us towards him. See, what we do in our mind is real interesting. We say that good performance ensures paradise on earth and bad performance will bring hell to earth. But that's not Christianity. It's definitely not the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus did great things and he was good on earth to bring misbehaviors to paradise. So we read the Bible. Does it say it's a sin? Is it bad stewardship? Is it just unwise what we're doing? Our life, is this reflected in the word? Because if the answer is yes, and you are feeling repercussions from that, then yeah, that's discipline. That's a discipline. And it's a kindness of God to bring it to you. In fact, it is a proof that he loves you. Because if he did not do that, it would show that there is no love there. But he loves you as a child. Listen, let's go back to our passage. Because 70 years of discipline is over, right according to time, according to prophecy, and now we're in this period of restoration. And I want to jump in at verse 66. So this is after all the long list of names and numbers, and this is what the Bible says for us. The whole assembly together was 42,360 people, besides their male and female servants, of whom there are 7,337. And they had 245 singers, male and female. So we're close to 50,000 there. Their horses were 736, their mules were 245, their camels 435, and their donkeys 6,720. Now some of the heads of fathers' houses gave to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 derricks of gold, 50 basins, 30 priest garments, and 500 minas of silver. And some of the heads of the fathers' houses gave into the treasury the work of 20,000 derricks of gold, 2,200 minas of silver. And what the rest of the people gave was 20,000 derricks of gold, 2,000 minas of silver, and 67 priest garments. So the priests, the Levites, 
the gatekeepers, the singers, some of the people, the temple servants, and all Israel lived in their towns. And when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. Big question, what does a restored life look like? Once they're brought back, no longer in exile, what does it look like? I see two big things. One is distinction. They're a distinct people. That's what, the, that's what all the thing is. I mean, that's what the wall is about, the selective repopulation. It's about being a distinct people. Did you even notice that they're not even opening up the gates all day long? See, the gates used to always be open, but now they're like, hey, only from this time, we have, we have open and closed hours now. This time to this time, we can open up the gates. Otherwise, you're on your own, man. You're not coming in. Why? They're trying to tamp down the flow of traffic. They're keeping an eye on who is coming in and who is coming out. It makes sense. They're trying to build distinction because now their calendars work different. Their money works different. They're doing all kinds of things that the nations of the world are looking on and saying, that is unheard of, which begs the question for you and me today, are we distinct? I mean, don't just answer it. Think it through. Are you distinct? In a world of minivans and holidays and hectic schedules and bills to pay, do I stand out as distinct? You know, we swim in a soup of the world and forget that we're not of the world, that we're just traveling here, just here for a moment. Here's a rule of thumb. If no one is telling you that you're different or asking why you are different, then, friends, you're not different or you don't know people right? How you handle your marriage, how you raise your kids, how you spend your money, how you line out your goals, how you spend your words. Does it provoke question marks in the people around you? Does anyone ever do that? Extra credit. Go ask your friends if they see a difference in you. Ask them. Just sit down and say, hey, is the fact that I'm a Christian obvious to you? Or do you wonder about it? Does it sound like a scary question? I've asked it before. It is a scary question. What, where does my life not look like yours and the only explanation is Jesus? Have that conversation. Hey, it's good for them to say those things out loud. B, it's good for you because you might not be as distinct as you think you are. That's what happens when you live in a culture and you start taking in just the, the everything that's around you. You stop looking as distinct. Second thing that I notice in these people is that they are sacrificial in their worship. We saw that, right? There's about $30 million in their money. Who knows what it would be worth today? $30 million approximately. Who really knows, right? But because I don't know what a priestly garment costs, you know? I mean, I was able to trace it through gold and silver. That's not hard, but who knows really? $30 million is about as close as anyone's been able to get. But what does our lifestyle cost us? Another rule of thumb, it's not generous unless it's sacrificial. It's not. You can't have something that's generous if there was not sacrifice attached to it. Again, worship is not just singing. We know that. I mean, I hope we know this. We say it all the time. Worship is how you carry your life. It's how you interact with your neighbors. It's, it's how you interact with your morning routine. Worship is how you interact with your body. It's how you interact with your check. It's everything, your retirement, your investments. Worship is how we carry everything, our dreams, our task lists. It's not less than Sunday, but, friend, it is far, far more than just Sunday. It's every moment of every space. Sacrifice means being pressed to the place where we have to say no to things in our life in order to say yes to the best things in our life. I mean, if you think about this moment, we're not going to go there. We don't have time. Where Jesus notices and considers this poor widow who puts everything that she has into the offering box. Among a parade of men and women, I'm sure, that were just dropping all kinds of stuff in there that really didn't cost them anything. And what does he say? He says, man, she's given more than all of them. Because her giving to that moment meant she could not do so many things like potentially eat. It meant that she couldn't put a little away for a rainy day. It meant that she had to say no to things that other people would have said, hey, I think that's pretty important, right? Everybody else that was just dropping money in there, they were able to do whatever they wanted to do. They didn't have to go, well, I, I want a Tundra. I guess I'll get a Tacoma, you know? I guess, I mean, I wanted three jet skis. Now I can only afford one. I mean, they were, they were making some serious cuts to be sacrificial, to be generous. This is What's beautiful about your Bible 
there are so many moments where you will catch a New Testament text being read as if the Old Testament one was right before them and open. We catch that in this one. In Romans 12, we see Paul saying something, and I, I could swear, I would put money on it. I would, I would make a bet that he had Nehemiah 7 open to some degree or was aware of it or reflected on it as he wrote this. This is what it says. By the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but <clears throat> be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Your spiritual worship is to be sacrificial and distinct. Paul is talking about Nehemiah 7, and Nehemiah 7 is building Romans 12 for us. This is what we know. God builds the world, and then he fills it, calls it good, calls it good. He builds the ark, and he fills it with the future of mankind. He builds his nation, and then he fills it with who? His chosen people. He builds Jerusalem, and then he fills it with, what do we learn today? Distinct worshipers. Then he builds his church, and then he fills it with living sacrifices. You know, the Lamb's Book of Life, mentioned in Revelation 21, it holds the names of those who will live in the New Jerusalem, a city with gates that are pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. In fact, they don't have to worry about the heat of the day and how long it's open because there is no sun. There is no moon. It's just the radiant glory of God himself giving everybody light. The names were thoughtfully engraved in this book since before the oceans were even poured. Not just your name, friend, but your life. Everything you've done. Everything you've done. There are no placeholders it records your thoughts, your actions, your adventures, your pain. Listen to me, you matter. You count. You can't. You're part of something much bigger than yourself, but you matter. Even in discipline. And in the end of all ends, one day we are going to behold Jesus, who is our better temple, and we will behold each other, our better family. And we will celebrate around a better table. And we will laugh, and we will remember, and we will be thankful. And all of sin will be finished forever. Go ahead and stand with me. I'd like to take communion with you. And listen, I know some people are here.